So why are we talking about the consumer energy revolution and what does that mean? We as consumer advocates know that consumers around the world are hurting in their bills. 141 million people were pushed into extreme poverty by the rolling global energy crisis caused by over-reliance on fossil fuels. Meanwhile, renewables are producing the cheapest electricity in history. This disparity cannot continue and must change, but thankfully there is an alternative. Empowering consumers to install their own solar panels, heat pumps, efficient appliances, electric vehicles, smart meters, batteries, is completely changing the game. Consumers no longer need to be passive recipients of expensive, dirty, polluting energy. They can be active generators, users, storers, savers, sharers of their own cheap and limitless renewable energy. And this is disrupting the traditional command control model of energy production and creating a myriad of distributed local solutions that are better adapted to meet consumers' needs and saving consumers money, of course. This is not a dream, it's already happening. 36 million people around the world installed solar on their rooftops last year, which amazingly was a 50% surge in the overall rooftop solar capacity in the world. And I was amazed to read a couple of weeks ago um, from the best uh, climate finance report out there that consumers now collectively around the world invest $184 billion a year in clean energy tech. That's electric vehicles, home energy efficiency improvements, solar panels, and the rest. This is almost double what all of the globe's governments spend in total on climate. So consumers are already the true climate leaders, and that's even with all the barriers they face and without the opportunities that we need to give them. So in today's run of show, we're gonna go into um, hearing the panelists view on this topic. We're gonna go into two deep dives into finance because upfront consumer financing for expensive pieces of tech is a real barrier. Then we're gonna look at the prosumer, the producer and consumer of energy. How can digitalization help them what new opportunities are available to them in markets such as Europe. And then we're gonna start with a call to action and I've got something very exciting to show with you. Um, and I'm gonna, Rosie did this yesterday's session. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I'm gonna keep you on the edge of your seats uh, to find out what it is. It's definitely not another report. Uh, <laughs> but let me start uh, by introducing our wonderful panelists. And let's start with our consumer advocates, Olaf King, your director of advocacy at Consument and Bond which is uh, one of Consumers International's largest and most loved members. Uh, and you also are on the board of BEOC, uh, the European Consumer Organization, and run a number of consumer class litigation, interestingly, against Volkswagen uh, on the Dieselgate scandal, which speaks directly to the consumer rights issues we'll be talking about today. Stefan uh, Larenas, you are president of ADECU, who is the National Consumer Organization in Chile. Uh, and Stefan, you have many, many years uh, of experience standing up for consumers and organizing research and studies and product testing in the consumer interest. I didn't know this till recently, but you are an ex-Consumers International colleague and from the year I was born for eight years, uh, you, <laughs> you actually you actually led uh, Latin American Office of Consumers International's work on sustainable consumption and the environment. Uh, and I've read some of your reports from that era and they're not out of date. Um, so really wonderful to have you still with us. McCain Ereri, second session today. I hope you're not flagging. You are Director of Demand, Jobs and Livelihood at the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And that's the key, isn't it? It's both people and planet. And that's why we're so thrilled to have you here. You have many years experience on energy access projects um, with IKEA Foundation, World Bank, and many other uh, global stakeholders. And when I first met you at COP27 last year, you were working for CLASP as Director of Energy Access, and there you ran uh, a $6 billion uh, portfolio of research, uh, and you were the first person who really got it 
when it comes to consumer education, consumer protection, uh, that I actually met at COP last year. So thrilled that you are here with us in Nairobi. I'm going to come to you, Jones, um, who is one of our two esteemed business panelists. You are the co-founder and managing director of Zua Energy. Um, is this better? I'll, I'll keep it closer. And I know that there's some, some background noise from the interpretation, so apologies uh, to some of us for that. Zua Energy is a fantastic company in Malawi, uh, providing solar asset financing. What does that mean? That means rural consumers who have never had access to electricity getting it for the first time uh, and being able to pay through flexible mobile payments. Looking forward to hearing how you and your double role as board member of GoGlo, which is the off-grid solar uh, industry association, have been bringing consumer protection into the heart of that business model. And our other esteemed business panelists, we're very honored to have Carol Kirch, who is the country president of Schneider Electric East Africa. You'll all know what Schneider Electric is, which is a leader in the energy transition space. And Carol comes to this panel with over 20 years of experience in the business world across sectors uh, and has won many awards as the first uh, Kenyan CEO uh, of Schneider Electric. So thrilled to have you here to speak about digitalization and the new frontiers for consumers in energy. And last but certainly not least, we have Riyad Medeb, Riyad Medeb, apologies Riyad, who is Director of the Sustainable Energy Hub at the UN Development Programme. And Achim Steiner, the Administrator of UNDP, gave you the task of catalyzing and bringing together all of the impressive work that the Development Programme does around the world in many, many countries on energy. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you why Energy from the development perspective is never just energy. It's livelihoods, it's economic growth, um, it's a just future for all. You've heard enough from me, so I'm gonna go straight to you, McKenna, um, for your first reactions on, on this topic. Why does the consumer energy revolution matter for both people and planet? Um, thank you so much, Oliver, and thank you for reminding me the story of how we met and how we stood outside in the sun in Sharm El Sheikh, finally having met someone who's thinking about the consumer and as much as I think we must. Uh, and then you saying, oh my God, someone in the energy space who is talking about the consumer and we stood outside there in the sun and, and had a conversation that, that has led to, to me sitting here. So it, it's really great to be um, here in this panel because really we are at a crossroads in terms of um, energy, the global energy, journey is really at a point where we cannot afford to do nothing now. The system is unfair. It is unfair for consumers because they are paying too much money, relying on dirty fuel, and paying a lot for it, right, for, for those energy services. It is unfair because the planet is suffering from the way that we are producing energy and consuming it, and we have to do something about it. So when we think about the environmental impact, in the face of climate change, we just have to shift to renewables. I think we all are starting to get this message across the world. I'm sure they're talking about it um, on the other side of, of, of the world in, in Dubai. But we, we need this shift. And that shift must be consumer-owned and consumer-driven. I don't think we can rely on the big industries, the big corporations, to do that shift fast enough. We must drive it ourselves. And so consumer-owned renewables seem to be a really promising way to move to a place which is pro people, but also protect our planet. We must embrace solar, wind, and other renewable resources, putting consumers at the heart of those. Because just as Oliver said, they are low cost, they are um, beneficial for the planet, but also for um, give agency to the consumer. And it's not just sort of an energy problem, it really is a social problem, it's an economic equity problem, and that comes really in the way that we are seeing these skyrocketing prices. You talked about the 141 million people who have just been pushed into energy poverty in 2022 alone by the rising cost of fuel and the rising cost of energy. And that really should underscore the radical change that we need to undergo. Consumers must be the ones to produce the energy, to store it, to sell it, to transfer it, and, and to make the absolute use of it. And that's globally. We need a lot of concession of funding for that, right? We cannot keep saying that consumers, we're gonna put the consumers at the heart and then not enable them, not incentivize them with money, with 
um, policies that are appropriate with government action that allows them to take on these roles. And I think this kind of favorable financing po financial policy is, is something that we're not talking about enough. And when we make declarations, we just make declarations about the, the quantum of money that we could possibly maybe give, and we're not activating that money to support consumers properly. Um, especially when I think about the context that we're sitting in here in Nairobi in Africa, in Kenya and Africa, a lot of the consumers are really low income. So the affordability question comes to a really, really, uh, I guess, the tip of the spear in places like here. But we're seeing a revolution because, for example, solar power is really changing lives. At the kind of low cost and with innovative financial mechanisms like pay as you go, we're seeing it really bring down the cost, for example, of lighting by 85%. And that allows, for the first time, consumers to take charge of their own energy and to also be kind of um, do that in a way that allows their productivity but is affordable for them. And so I guess to, to close, I want to say that we're, we're talking about really a, a spot in time that we cannot miss. We cannot miss the moment to do what big oil is not going to do, what governments are slowly doing but not fast enough, but what we can put, uh, what power and agency we can give to the consumer. Because if you ask for it, governments will deliver, right? If you ask for it, private sector will bring it. If you ask for it, philanthropy will put money uh, and, and kind of backing behind this consumer revolution. So I just want all of us to go away thinking that, yes, it's about people, it's about planet, it's about social justice, it's about equity, it's about economic equity as well, and globally, not just, um, I guess, in the West, where, where the transition seems, um, I guess, ready and obvious, but here as well in the global south where we, we even need to get on the step in the first place before we start transitioning. Um, and, I, and I think that, that I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, McKenna. And I think that is the opportunity. Um, and we have that opportunity to create a clean energy future that is socially just. But before we get there, we need consumers to make decisions. You mentioned pay-as-you-go solar. That means consumers signing up to a new financial product, having a new appliance on their roof that they've never used before, understanding how to use it, making sure it doesn't break, seeking redress if things go wrong. This is a really difficult thing to get right because it means mobilizing lots and lots of people to make lots and lots of decisions. So we need to be very clever about removing barriers. So Stefan, I want to go to you. You have had many experience representing consumers in Chile. What are the main barriers that consumers face when they're trying to install and adopt clean energy solutions in their home? Well, uh, as Oliver said in the introduction, I did work for Consumers International and I work for local organization now because uh, small is all too beautiful. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, what is the main barriers? Freedom of choice. Chile have uh, been increasing um, uh, a lot during the last uh, 10 years in order to uh, introduce a non-conventional energy source. But what are the benefits for the consumers? What we can call the energy revolution in Chile. Energy revolution in Chile is still standby. Why? Because uh, the transmission, the electricity, the companies uh, just uh, sell us to the consumers uh, coal or traditional uh, forms of energy. So we, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice and if we, if we will have the choice to, to choose our energy, uh, they will be surely very, very um, revolutionary. Because we have, uh, as you know, uh, Desierto de Atacama, who is a solar, uh, is a solar source, uh, is enormous. 
amount of salt. So what we have now is just individual solution. Because if you have uh, access to panel, solar panel, you, f you can manage your own home. But social solution is still waiting. Policy making is our duty, and we have uh, been uh, we have done a lot of efforts to change the matrix, and we have uh, successful, but we have not been successful that the energy companies could provide us of uh, different kinds of energy so you can choose. If you don't can choose, it's very difficult to change the, the, our, our, our behavior. So our task at consumer organization is just this. Policy making, regulation, uh, and inform consumers what, uh, what will be the benefits for your, for your wallets and your home. So uh, it's still remaining the question and the main barrier for conclusion is we don't have freedom of choice. Thank you so much, Stefan. And I think in that, choice is wrapped up so much, correct? And I just want to highlight that at Consumers International, and Stefan has been part of this, as many in the audience, we have campaigned at the global level for the legitimate needs of consumers uh, to be recognized. And these have become the UN guidelines for consumer protection. And one of these is protection of the economic interests of consumers and consumer choice. Uh, and I think that one really encapsulates a lot of this. It's about information, it's about finance, it's about redress and all of the other things um, that we'll be going on to. Carol, can I come to you for your reactions? I mean, I'm reading here that your illustrious career in energy started uh, in this country and from a personal experience of rural energy poverty, which galvanized you uh, to become a leader in business. So from your experience and both personally and in business, how do you think consumers experience barriers and, uh, and how, can, how can we address those? Thank you very much, Olivia, for, for that question. And um, for me, energy access is very personal. Um, growing up in rural Kenya with no energy and working in the energy sector for most of my career and still my own mother did not have connection to the grid for many years uh, means that you know we have to be on the table to discuss. And I must say Kenya has made significant progress in in the access conversation. Now, when we talk access, we also need to talk affordability. And I think today the biggest barrier that we have is really affordability. And obviously there's been many other players that have you know, supported the energy access conversation, um, specifically electricity. I think the, the business models around uh, pay as you go have allowed many people to get access. However, we must ask our quest, uh, ourselves the question is, even though these people now have access, is it sufficient? And is it allowing them to grow their needs? So if today I'm needing only light, tomorrow I will need to charge my phone, the next day I will need to watch TV. And it's constantly costing money to upgrade. And we don't ask ourselves the question, is this sustainable? And so again, Beyond the sustainability conversation, we also then ask, as we upgrade, what is happening to the devices that we are leaving behind? Who's managing the end of life? And how is that impacting the planet? Even though we are driving conversations on transition, let's also ask ourselves, who's managing the end of life? And of course, Kenya as well is taking the lead in terms of electric mobility, uh, a very big and vibrant sector around the two wheelers, which is still an energy conversation. But the main barrier today as well is affordability. Uh, many, many people would love to switch. They see the benefit, but the high cost of acquiring the, the especially the uh, electric bikes is, is costing. And most of these people use the electric bikes for commercial purposes. It's their livelihoods. They would like to switch, but they cannot afford. And even when they switch, 
they want assurance that they can actually be able to run without stopping. So there's still a lot of topics around um, you know, wanting to switch to renewable energy, wanting to make it a way of life, but how do we sustain? So those are my thoughts in this topic. Thank you so much, Carol. And I think the way you've highlighted, you can't just look at one stage of the consumer or product life cycle. You can't just th say, oh, if we inform consumers with good labeling, it's, it, we're all good. We need to think about what's happening at the end of life of the products once the consumer has the product to know that they can use it uh, and continue to save money um, throughout the product life cycle. So thank you for that flag. Given that you said the main barrier is affordability, I think now is the time for us to move on to our first deep dive, which is into finance. Many of the consumer technologies we've talked about, solar panels, batteries, heat pumps, come with a high upfront cost. So for the majority of consumers, they will need to access finance to be able to, to benefit from these technologies. I want to come to you first, Riyadh. Since you became director of the Sustainable Energy Hub, from a background looking at technology, innovation, working with small island developing states, um, you've really focused on finance. And I want to ask you, why is finance so important uh, for consumer access to clean energy solutions. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this presentation for us today and your questionnaire and answer. I find to make the link between the achievement of energy access and energy transition and the development of the world. Uh, the question on why access to renewable energy finance is pivotal for the destination uh, transition. And uh, for us, the destination transition by its essence is energy fairness and inclusivity in the shift of towards sustainable energy. And firstly, access to energy finance act as the constant for enabling uh, the adoption of renewable energy uh, solutions. And this is what we are doing, for example, in Africa through our Africa Mini Grid program, where we try to reach in 21 countries the people who are left behind in the rural areas, giving them the possibility of accessing to uh, renewable energy, those people who are completely off-grid, and giving them the possibility of accessing to some financial instrument in order for them to make a choice in terms of uh, access. Sustainable <coughs> and affordable, as you mentioned just a few seconds ago. Imagine what we can do with accessing to finance. One million dollars invested in renewable energy facilities can generate three times more jobs compared to the same infrastructure through fossil fuel uh, energy. By ensuring financial accessibility to renewable energies, we are not only catalyzing employment opportunities, but also we are helping the consumers to have access to education, to healthcare services. And the, the current uh, situation, especially in Africa, we have 85% of all the global energy, all the global renewable energy investment are benefiting only less than 50% of the world population. And in Africa, accounted for only 1%, one, only 1% one of additional capacity in 2023. To our Sustainable Energy Hub in UNDP, we are recognizing the importance and the challenge for bridging the gap in terms of access to finance. And we have uh, developed and supported in Eastern Africa the possibility of having access to new financial instrument through aggregation instrument. Thank you so much, and we can follow up with this afterwards if you have questions. I mean, the aggregation point is extremely important because one of the big challenges and one of the reasons why we only have 3% of global climate finance coming into Africa, and even less than that going into the pockets of consumers on the ground who are installing solutions and benefiting from them, is because it's so difficult to get the, the scales right. Big money 
small solutions. And Jones, I want to come to you because you've found a way to do this. Um, you're not the only uh, Paygo solar company, uh, but you are one of the leaders in Malawi. And interestingly, you've found a way to do it in a way that protects consumers by design. And then you've worked with other companies through Gogla, the industry association, to create this consumer protection code. Now, I know this has six principles, but we don't have very much time. So if you could choose two principles from this consumer protection code and explain to our audience, both in the room and many consumer advocates following online the recording, how do they work? How do they protect consumers? And what does this mean for access to finance and the imperatives Riyadh just outlined?
the sector. So I have I work in the in the, in that space, and we interact with a lot of manufacturers. One of the problems, and again, critic that has been there is that a lot of products and manufacturers are are closed in. So doing a lot of uh, uh, um, I'd say uh, uh, closed in designs, which cannot be easily you know accessed by other manufacturers. So even as 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 low as I'm calling low because I think it's a, it's it's a low in our industry, but as low as even using a specific kind of screws, so that you know uh, if if someone is trying to open my solar home system, they cannot open it if they don't if they don't have specific screwdriver to open these uh, these uh, these uh, kind of products. So uh, the issue of uh, repairability uh, after sales service, make sure that as a company we are there and we are ensuring that. If the customers buy the product from us, we are not just selling the product; we are there with them. And if if something happens, we will be able to 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 help them and uh, and service the product. Uh, not just saying we have got two years warranty, but actually, you know, uh, uh, leaving the word. So how we do that as well is we've created uh, a number of uh, uh, last mile centers of, of uh, distribution, and from these centers, we also use these centers to implement our uh, buyback policy. Um, uh, Kara, I think, mentioned the issue of uh, uh, who is taking care of these products. Yeah, it's it's a huge problem. But, uh, you know, there are also some good examples of what is happening. So, for, like I said, in our case, we have this buyback policy. So, from our hubs of distribution, if customers have a product that, you know, is is uh, end of life, maybe five years or six years, they bring it back to us, we buy it in exchange of another, you know, uh, 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 new product. So that's our commitment to the customer that we are here for you and uh, we'll not just want to sell you, but we'll be there with you. And even if you need other plants, we can actually grow uh, 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 with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to highlight for the audience that this is not a barrier to your business model, is it? Jones, because putting in place, and you've, you've gone through two of the principles, but putting in place these, these six principles has led you to double your collection rates, um, by which I mean, um, you know, one of the issues for pay-as-you-go companies, as I understand it, is that often consumers are over-indebted and therefore cannot repay um, through mobile money. But you've doubled your collection rates um, by putting consumer protection by design. We need to move on, but if you've got a very, very quick response. Yeah, sure. So exactly, like I said earlier on, is that there's, a, there's an issue of uh, over financing customers. So if you are doing the right thing, you are screening your customers, and you have this uh, kind of you know uh, continuous customer engagement and interaction, we've actually seen that yeah, we we can actually achieve much higher uh, collection rates, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, opposed to just selling and then assuming that the customer is going to know uh, 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 what they're doing. So just for context, for example, the industry average for collections in the Pego industry is about maybe 65%. Mm -hmm. We are doing 90% in Malawi in our company. So we are collecting far more than what most companies are doing, but it's because of that customer engagement and, uh, and ensuring that we're not over-financing customers, selling to the right customers and protecting those customers. It's a great example, and I'm interested to hear from the consumer advocates how we can keep you guys to account. You guys sign up to a consumer protection code. Um, how can we keep you to account and then educate consumers to go with companies that have signed up to that code because they're more likely to get that aftercare support. They're less likely uh, to face um, over-indebtedness. We need to move on uh, to our next deep dive, um, but I wanted to give the audience a quick opportunity to ask any questions or make a short comment if anyone is Juan Carlos. I'll come with my mic, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, this is just a, a quick comment and a question because this relates to uh, discussions we had yesterday. And one of the key principles that Gogla had in the Consumer Protection Code and SIGA participated in this process was the principle on data privacy. And there is a very important word and sentence that talks about basically legitimate purpose of data collection and even limitation on the scope of data that is being collected. It was a very important discussion that all of the, the members of the Consumer Protection Working Group had on that wording. And I would like to get some any insights on the implementation of that part of the privacy 
part of the code and whether it became complicated, difficult to implement from the side of the company. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, I think the issue of uh, data protection and privacy is always a uh, 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 you know a confusing thing for companies. So I think for Pego companies, like in our case, the kind of data that, that we are collecting mostly is is around uh, is data that first of all should enable us to be able to to screen uh, uh, these customers and uh, and uh, also to an extent, for example, if we are to maybe uh, get some subsidies, uh, uh, we also use that data for verification as well. So I think that's pretty much what we're doing. So our data would be used by ourselves uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, selling and customer engagement, interaction, but also uh, we would be able to use it to give it to third parties. In most cases, it's the government because they have to verify and maybe extend some uh, uh, subjects to us. And in our customer contract, uh, we make sure that that is actually, it's, it's, it appears. So the customer is aware that, yes, we are getting their data and the data is mostly for our own use, but we can also share it with specific uh, third parties. And in this case, we actually mentioned those, th those third parties. And the role of us when we're selling is to make sure that we explain to these customers so that they understand. Because again, in most cases, people don't even understand what they're getting into. Thank you so much. And an excellent question. And assuming this is also on data, because I think this, this cross-cutting, well, go ahead. Just a quick question out of ignorance. What role, if any, did government subsidies play? Like in the US, we had the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a, made a huge difference to consumers. Is that possible for Africa, or I, I'm just uh, ignorant? Can I maybe put this to McKenna? Um, because I think we've talked about private finance and you know, what is the role of government subsidies? Where can that continue to pay a part? Yeah, so I, I don't know if you said this before, but I work for Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. We are capitalized to extend catalytic capital to enable just transitions and energy access. So one of our major programs, especially on this space that we're talking about, is a subsidy program for uh, appliances. Now we've tried to engage governments to, to do that. So our funding is philanthropic, so in, in essence also very limited. Um, but we've tried to engage government really hard to show them the model of how to do smart subsidies. Because there have been some subsidies done by different governments. If you're Indian, you can think of Kusum, you can think of other different kind of subsidies that have been done with varying effects. Some of them unintended consequences that are quite dire for the environment, for the people who are getting the appliances. So they need to be created and, and um, match to the incentives, you, uh, to the behavior you want, to the kind of products you want in the market. And, and a lot of governments are still learning how to do that. And they, are, they seem wary of, of subsidies and, and they, this um, a little bit negative perception of what a subsidy can do. But I'm a firm believer that if we're gonna get to where we need to get in this revolution, we absolutely must have them. No country on this planet has gotten to 100% electrification with affordable energy without subsidies. And yet somehow we expect the countries that are remaining to access electricity to somehow do it through the private sector. It's just not feasible. So I'm a firm believer, I think governments should do more and we are trying to play a role, for example, with, with companies like Zua to enable this kind of movement towards subsidization. Thank you so much, McKenna. Um, I can see many nodding heads in the panel and in the room. Nadim, can I come to you a little bit later uh, for that question? And we wanna move on to the new world we're creating. So you've bought the kit, you've got the finance, you've got the subsidy, you've got the kit. But now you're producing as well as using energy, you're storing energy, you could even be sharing energy. We call this in English prosumerism or the prosumer. I want to come to you, Olaf, because in the Netherlands you are fairly advanced down this road of helping consumers to become system shapers and designers. What are the new opportunities and how can we make this easy, simple and accessible for the majority of consumers? Uh, thank you, Oliver. I, I come to that. Um, I'm joining this deep dive with a lot of pleasure. It's uh, very inspiring. Before I dive deeper, I would like to add some discuss uh, something to the discussion. We do not have to be uh, too naive. Uh, we're talking about solutions, and I come to the solutions that we find in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the uh, big troubles that we see, and it's the elephant in the room, like we see that, is that uh, big oil made in 2022, I guess, about 200 billion profit. Okay, fair enough, we would say. Uh, at the same time, 
consumers all over the world were paying amazingly high prices for their bills. Um, if you and I would decide tomorrow to make twice as much money as we do today, I think most of us would have, would, would have a problem. And my boss in the room, as you would probably say, <laughs> thank you, Olaf. Before I come deep, deeper in the dive, that, that would make a huge amount of money in order to help us uh, realize this uh, transition, this energy transition. Um, in the Netherlands, in Europe, we try, and I'm very glad that Consumer International takes this initiative, we try to combine forces. Um, we are having two things in mind. We think that the supervisors could do more than they're actually doing, because it's actually, you could call it the oligopoly. So how is this possible? Uh, there's a lot of reasons they can give us, but how is this possible and how can you manage that? That's one thing. And another option that we are investigating is, would it be possible to start, like I guess in the United States already is happening, a collective action, class action on behalf of the climate, uh, on behalf of all the consumers that were disadvantaged. Having said that, um, yes, I will dive deeper with all of you. In the Netherlands, we have some good experience with solar panels. Uh, about 25% of uh, um, all houses are heated by solar panels right now, uh, combined with a lot of uh, apps and technology. Sounds amazing, and we could be very proud of that. Um, two things to uh, add to that as a kind of disclaimer. Uh, that, that's something that I heard from both of you. Uh, solidarity. Um, investing in solar panels is very interesting uh, in a commercial way for a consumer. Uh, it, it has a, a return on investment within five or seven years. And there is some subsidy, but far from everyone is able to uh, uh, finance that himself. Uh, subsidy. So it's the, well, you could say the happy few in the Netherlands that is able to, uh, to pay for that. Uh, so why not ask Shell or <laughs> Exxon, for instance, to help us to, uh, the other, to, to do the other people the same. Another disclaimer that I would like to make is that this 25%, it sounds huge, adds only 2% of the total uh, energy consumption of the Netherlands. So we have a long way to go. But indeed, uh, it helps us, all these technology uh, apps, etc., to be, like you say, to, to be more self-sufficient, to, to, to be more independent from big market parties. And well, that's amazing, and that's good. So the development is all right, but we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And to get there, we need help from business. It's nothing that we can, any one stakeholder can do alone. We need finance. We need government subsidy. We need consumer advocacy, but we also need new solutions that make the most of digitalization for the consumer experience so they can take on this enlarged role as energy users, storers, generators. Carol, how is Schneider Electric helping consumers in East Africa do this? What do you see as the main challenges uh, and what, gives you, what makes you most excited about this frontier? So in East Africa, a lot of the work we are doing today is, is largely with industries. Uh, so I'm going to speak from that context, but I will also share the work we are doing elsewhere. So with um, many of the industries in East Africa today, we are having um, an energy efficiency conversation. Uh, we recently partnered with the Kenya Association of Manufacturers to drive um, an energy efficiency through digitalization. So part of the work we do is we sponsor an award uh, with the Kenya Energy, uh, sorry, Kenya Association of Manufacturers. They have an annual energy management awards, and one of the award we sponsor is a digitalization award. And we work with industries to basically monitor their energy consumption across the processes that they do through our technologies. And what we've discovered, actually, uh, some of the industries that installed our solutions, uh, one particular industry I'd like to share a quick case study had invested heavily in solar, and they were actually planning to do a second phase of solar. But when we went in to study uh, and in install the solutions, we made some very interesting discoveries. That one, they were doing um, their change of shift at midday. And of course, that's when you have your most solar uh, generation. And just by switching the time they changed the shift, they actually discovered that they didn't need to install an additional solar um, capacity. 
So these technologies just help you to see and study the patterns around your process. So coming back to consumers, uh, I, I, I mean, from a personal perspective, we do have a lot of um, technologies around the home. Uh, we call it Home Wiser, where we really then you know, help. We don't have a lot of installations in East Africa yet, um, but globally we, you know, we help, and I'm sure maybe some of you use those technologies. We help consumers to understand their energy usage, to switch off devices remotely, just you know, to manage your energy efficiency. And that way, you know, we all become better users of energy. That's fantastic. And I think there's a real opportunity for, and it's an overused word, but leapfrogging um, in East Africa because you have the tech uh, and the consumers are increasingly uh, accessing these systems. So let's make sure that they don't buy systems they don't need and make sure they can use them efficiently uh, in a way that really meets their needs. Well, thank you to our panelists for playing with us and, and going deep into those topics. I want to open it out to the audience. I'm af afraid we can't take questions from our virtual audience, um, but maybe I can come to you, Nadim, first. Uh, Nadim, you're the head of the network, a consumer organization in Pakistan, and you were telling me over dinner that you've installed your own solar storage system and you've wiped out your bills. Maybe you can comment a little bit about the opportunity to completely change the balance sheet at the end of the month for consumers and then ask your question. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I am a beneficiary of uh, this uh, solar system. Uh, so I have got installed like uh, uh, 10 kVA uh, and the, now I think the electricity company has to pay me uh, something around $100 a month. So it's a <laughs> deficit, it's, it's on uh, my side now. Coming back to this uh, debate, uh, there are like uh, multiple layers of uh, this debate. It's not simply consumer. It's um, uh, uh, geopolitics as well. You know, the fault lines are also changing. The region in which uh, Pakistan has been, there are uh, uh, power energy debates is going on at the macro level. At the micro level, uh, government is also beneficiary of uh, fossil fuel. Uh, because you know, most uh, in Pakistan, uh, roughly 60 to 70 percent of taxes are collected through indirect means, and the utility bill is the mean to uh, collect that taxes. So how to? So the government is uh, beneficiary to promote the fossil fuel, and if you see the energy uh, scene in Pakistan uh, right now, it's in in huge mess. Uh, like uh, uh, we have circular debt. Uh, um, because uh, they couldn't manage this, uh, the energy whole thing. And we have to reverse the whole clock to 90s because in 90s, 90% or I think 100% of the energy or uh, electricity was uh, coming from Heidel. And after that, we went for you know unbundling the whole system. We went for mixed energy, then the fossil fuel entered. And you know, the, uh, last year we were uh, like was hit by the floods, like the climate change, and at the same region was hit by that one, which was taking, uh, you know, producing energy from coal as a success story because you know it gave it, uh, employment to women and everything. And now we are talking about you know getting money from the compensation fund, but still you know the coal energy is very much part of our system. So if we go for, uh, you know, asking the government, and the government also gives subsidy to the, uh, you know, the consumers who are consuming something around 400 uh, units a month. Although it, it also gets a misuse, as you have already mentioned, the smart subsidy concept, because the rich people uh, get two, three meters installed, and, you know, they are also consuming that uh, kind of thing. So even the subsidy, which is going to the poor consumer, this is being charged to the uh, richer consumers, uh, you know, uh, because uh, they get the bill for not for 30 days, like for 35 days, you know, so all the tax calculations goes up and, you know, so the government uh, and the most important thing in the regional one, government wants to have a, uh, uh, a direct investment, foreign direct investment. It's coming into that energy fossil fuel one. Uh, if America goes to India, we also want it in Pakistan. And uh, there are like uh, 11 distribution companies 
Only one has been privatized, and China is very much interested in that one, China uh, national one. So Pakistan desperately needs foreign direct investment. So in that scenario, you know, subsidy going for the uh, renewable energy, I think it seems to be a uh, far off dream. Although government has alternative board, everything is there. Now the hydel uh, sources source uh, energy is roughly 25% of the total. In 90s, it was like 100%. So the more the consumers are there, more they switch over to that one. So it's, it's a very kind of a, a tricky situation. It's macroeconomics and the macroeconomics. Everything is at work. Thank you so much, Nadim, for giving us that macro perspective. And it's geopolitics as well as microfinance and everything in between. Before we go to the panel uh, for some reactions and final comments, can we get one more audience question, comments? I have a question about in the Netherlands, I was struck, you said 25% of the homes, but only one to 2% of the total energy. So why is that? Do they not have electric vehicles or? It's, it's, it's developing. It's also industry, of course, does the whole energy consumption in, in total, and then it's 2%. I think if all consumers were able to use uh, solar panels in a very efficient way, it would add to 20 or 25% in total. So we have some work to do from the industry perspective and also from consumers' perspective. But that's the, that's the background. Thank you very much for your questions, comments. I want to... Panelists, is there anyone who wants to come on a specific point, maybe Nadim's points? Riyadh, I can see your... Yes, there's one element, and it was also in the discussion that I had with the Lebanon and the Sudanese Association of Consumers. It is the for accessing to finance for uh, accelerating the energy transition, there are three main accelerators. One is the data, and we were discussing how to access to data, what we call the... Uh, digital intelligence, so using the data for planning, but also the AI new instrument. The second element, which I think is very important, and take into account the perspective of the consumers, is uh, the uh, thought leadership with national dialogue in a country, uh, so with the key actors. And the third element, which for me, for accessing to uh, finance, is the market development, taking into account the different instrument for uh, aggregation, but uh, also developing pipeline bankable uh, project. I do not see the possibility of accessing finance in emerging market just focusing on one issue. You need to have the three together you know, for you to, uh, to be able to have access uh, to finance. Thank you, Rihanna. I can see you're nodding, Olof. Does this, do those three resonate from a developed Netherlands, European country perspective. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, th th this is what it's all the, what is all about here at this, this congress to be inspired and to learn from each other. So I think there's there's, there's some good topics made. Uh, my final uh, um, conclusion would be actually to ask CI to take the lead, like you already do, because it's true we have some uh, micro issues that we are trying to uh, deal with uh, in the Netherlands and in Africa and wherever. It's good we can learn from each other. We have, we have also some macro issues like how are things organized in this market? And that is what we have to think about. And these markets we have to influence from the power that we have combining our forces. And I'm looking forward to working together with CI, Berg, etc., to, uh, to realize that. Thank you. That's a really lovely segue uh, into my closing. And I've got, I promised you an exciting thing that I was going to share with you. And I'm actually going to share two exciting things um, because you've been such an engaged audience. The first is, we need to show global leadership on this issue. As Olaf pointed out, 200 billion profits last year for big oil, whilst consumers are hurting 140 million people into extreme poverty. That is not acceptable. So we're really excited that we and 30 leading consumer advocates, including Witch from the UK, Consument and Bond uh, in the Netherlands, Consumers Lebanon, uh, leading a group from the Middle East signing this open letter, uh, which is calling on leaders at COP28 to make sure that in every decision that is made, they think about how can we ensure the consumer interest is upheld. So this is being published as a press release today uh, and being um, shared with the world's press. 
we're going to leave it open. Yeah, thank you very much. We're leaving it open to Consumers International members to join us till the end of Sunday. So see me outside the session or email me um, afterwards if you want to add your name uh, to that important call for action. That's one thing we can do as consumer advocates. We can shout, and we will shout on this issue as loud as we can. The other thing is learn, and I'm really happy that we've had uh, a great discussion from a very varied multi-stakeholder panel, and we're all learning how to do this, and we need new insights and research and data that can help us find those best practices, find the new collaborations that we need. And I'm excited that today we're also publishing a new report on what we call the one-stop shop, which is the type of solutions that bring everything together, everything from information and advice that we've talked about, to access to finance, to ongoing aftercare and repair and redress and class action in the case of things going wrong. This report is now up on our website, so please have a look, it's under publications. We've also got they should be outside or, and also by the plenary room, some QR codes which says, download this report. So do download the report, share with your colleagues and consumer advocates in your region. Zua Energy, uh, Jones's company, is one of the 11 detailed case studies uh, that we've included in this report. Um, so please do let us know your feedback on this. Um, it's a really exciting time when we're learning from all different types of stakeholders. So thank you so much for joining. Let's continue to shout, learn together. Um, I wanna give two last words from our panelists, one from Stefan and then from Riyadh, uh, and then we'll close off the session. Yes, very briefly. Subsidies are good. Okay, welcome to the, to the international sport, but we need stronger consumers organization. Stronger cons consumer organization means that we can make our voice heard and that is what we need. Be stronger and stronger so we can, we can uh, change and we can inform the population about climate change and what it means for the planet and for our world. Thank you, Stefan. And last word from you, Riyadh. Um, two days ago, it was agreed at the COP28 that we have to triple renewable energy and double energy efficiency. We cannot do it without the consumers. And you have to take this opportunity now with the new presidency of the Brazil, Brazilian presidency of the G21 and the Italian presidency of the G7, where you can influence this, uh, the tripling of renewable energy. It cannot be done just by the private sector. It cannot be done just by the public sector. It has to take into account the consumers. Thank you. Thank you and thank you all of our panelists and enjoy the closing session.